Okay, thank you. And first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's always nice to come and see passionate people. People are not afraid to say IPv6 only, because that's the way we need to go. And by the way, I was here two, three years ago, uh, talking about the IPv6 Council of Belgium that I'm chairing with another friend. And at that point of time, you were zero, and Belgium was 40, right? That's where I'm coming from. Now we are 50, but you, get, get, you bump to 20%, so congratulations. I mean, I guess it's part of the work of people in this room. Pretty much like Michael said, it takes enthusiastic people to make things change. And you were those gentlemen, or, and ladies, obviously. Anyway, so um, I'm part of a group called PEARL, Paris Innovation and Research Lab, even if I'm a French speaking, I'm Belgian, but anyway. Uh, we are there, a group of 20 people, including PhD student, postgraduate, and people older like me. Um, and we only work in an IPv6 only world. What can we do there? What do we need to do to come there? And that's part of what I'm presenting today here. Okay, quickly, I will expose the problem. What problem are we trying to solve? And basically, the solutions are two parts. One, that the network tells something about multi-homing and multi-services to the host. And the other part is how the network can actually implement this. Problem statement. Before it was easy, right? You were having your old laptop or a desktop, an acoustic coupler, and a V21 for the old guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it was only ASCII. Now it runs IP, and we were adding more and more interface. Look about this thing. And you've been there, right? All of us, I hope, have been there. The laptop, OK, internet connectivity, yes, to multiple dongles of dongles of dongles, but anyway, still doing it. Wi-Fi, and of course, tethering with the phone. Three interface already. And now the connection, you have basically one router, you are lucky, on the exit, but connected to two ISP. And the thing in green, that's an IPsec tunnel, a VPN. So basically, if you want to go to the internet, you have four choice. Through the mobile ISP, through your VPN, through ISP1 and ISP2, multi-home. So now, of course, the guy like the Facebook and the Microsoft and the Cisco of the world, we do BGP and easy. My wife work for SMB, no, right? No BGP, there are 10 people inside, so no way. So, how do we do multi-homing? So, sorry, I have to say a dirty word, okay? so. Like the French say, right? So that's okay. So assume I'm selecting, basically I want to exit through service provider two. And I'm not really selecting, right? The host is doing something, the operating system select one based on the cost or whatever. The network somewhere will route me to this router based on the default route, which is unique. And then when I want to go to ISP2, I need to be sure that I do not, right, in IPv4, that's, because indeed, if I don't translate the RFC 1918 to an ISP address from ISP2, I will be dropped by BCP 38, anti-spoofing. And I do want to get the traffic come back this way, okay? Again, it's not the way we do it at large scale enterprises, that's the way how it's done in SMB, and there are specific devices sold for this. Mm. Comes V6. Of course, now we have two ISP. You do not use RFC 1918 in IPv6. So you use two, typically for SMB, PS space, one from BT, one BSkyB, or whatever. And you distribute those addresses everywhere in your network. And the same for tethering. And the same for the corporate VPN. So you end up, in each every host, having four addresses at the bare minimum, or addresses coming from four prefixes, right? The two ISP, the VPN, and the mobile ISP. Now we need to tell the host, A, which address do you need to select to pick? And there are some RFC for this. But even more, we need to be to ensure that the traffic is routed to the right place. Example, think about CDN. There was a question on the gentleman over there of CDN. What if 
I do my request for, let's say I'm going to the ITF, which is hosted in Cloudflare. I want to go to the ITF, but the DNS request is sent to the mobile DNS server. I am from Belgium, so he will give me the cache of Akamai in Brussels, right? Because of a mobile, I appear like a Belgian guy, even in UK. Now, my web request is going through the Wi-Fi here. And now we need to go, yeah, but I will go through Brussels, which is not that far away, right? But think about when I'm traveling to Australia, for instance. And you see all those things. Basically, you have multiple set of parameters coming from all the interface and all the addresses, but you need to use them in a consistent way. It was for the DNS. What about routing? What about the exit point? And there's a slide from Jen Linkova from Google, where basically, and I'm re simply reusing the slide from other people to show that it's not problem invented by a guy from Cisco. That's real problem. The internet with one server, two ISP, red and blue, <coughs> and an internal network. And the host on the left are the green box. Two ISP, meaning that you propagate inside the two prefixes, and all the hosts on the, on the left-hand side has got addresses from the two prefixes. Now, we need to be sure that when the host on the top left use the blue address, it's routed through ISP1, ISP8, the blue one, else it will be dropped. And same thing now, at the bottom one, if you use the red address, it needs to be routed based on the source. Okay, not on the destination. It's a default route. So the default route is this way, but only if you have a red address, and then you go to ISP and you find. Why? If you select for any kind of reason the blue address, you need to be routed differently and exit at the ISP blue. And why would you select the red or the blue? By default, by the source address selection algorithm, the longest match, which is the reason why this guy is using the blue address to reach an address which is close to the blue ISP. That's the default behavior. Uh, we talk about the um, API ball, not so easy. Source address selection, and I think that you will agree, is another nightmare. Okay, and uh, there is not even ULA there, so we are lucky. Zach and Veronica, a colleague of yours, Marcus Keane, presented this in Prague. Roughly the same thing, but with real addresses. So, this is the Microsoft network, and we've got two Microsoft people here for any questions, right? <laughs> so, laptop, he is connected obviously to the corporate greenish color of the Microsoft network. So you receive an address from 2A0. But they are also doing what they call local exit. So they exit from a sales office or technical office directly to the internet via the blue ISP, 2001DB8. And they push all the addresses and the two prefix everywhere. So far so good, right? You want to go to something inside 2A01, you use the green address. You want to go to the internet, most probably you will go and use the blue address, right? Because source address selection. Mm -hmm. So far so good. But Microsoft is also using its own address space for Azure in the cloud. Now, which address will the laptop and the operating system, um, I guess Windows, right? <laughs> Not only there. <laughs> or, 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 or Linux, I don't know. I don't know. It can be everything. Everything. Okay, anyway, I was. Uh, it was I've been in Seattle, I've seen also, <laughs> anyway. So, any operating system here, we look, oh, I need to 2A01, I have two address, 2A01 something, and 2001, the longest match is the green. And I'm going through the corporate network, which is not what you want to do. So hopefully it will be routed back, so no connectivity, but it's not optimum at all. Okay, so we see example, real example uh, there. So we need to solve it. As I briefly explained at the beginning, one way to solve it is to tell the host and the application which are the prefixes that you can use to get an IP address from, and why would you prefer to use this one, 
rather than simply relying on the longest match, which is really crude. So we have a draft, and the world, you, you find back Marcus Keane here as an author, together with people from Cisco, myself, and Pierre, and two guys from Apple. So there is a huge interest from IT services, from OS vendors, and from network vendors there. So we talk about something called provisioning domain. Provisioning, that's all the information you need to provision a network device to work. IP address, subnet mask, I mean, IPv6 is always slash 64 most of the time. What are my recursive DNS server? What are my DNS search list? Which is my next op. We make a bundle of this. And anytime you use one IP address, you need to use this next stop, this DNS server, and so on and so on. That's a bundle, it's called provisioning domain. And we extend this PVD, which is until now only at the layer three, by other applications that are more relevant, basically, for the applications. And I shall describe this. So we make a bundle, right? So you will not select one and the next stop, which is the wrong one. How do we do it? We use, by the way, this IETF draft, okay? Just to be sure it's not shipping or whatever, even if you are far away in the implementation part. The PVD option is sent in all the route advertisement, pretty much like the PIO for the prefix, the route IO uh, for the route and so on. What's, the only thing which is really interesting there is the PVD ID FQDN that identifies the PVD the set of information. As soon as they are identified, it allows an application to select one or the other, for instance, right? You need an ID for this. There are other stuff like, we're skipping a couple of information, there is an H bit. H means that you can fetch additional information. It's optional. But if the H is there, you use the fully qualified domain name you got into the array, you do HTTP over uh, TLS to a dot well known slash PVD, right? You get the array, and then you fetch over HTTP over TLS more information, which is basically a JSON file. JSON are human readable. They are trendy as well, but quite useful. And for instance, at what you can find there. We can find a name, which could even be localized, Okay, so when you go to Beijing, you will get something in English character set and not in Chinese character set, uh, localized name. Um, we were even thinking at some point of time to put some characteristic about the bandwidth because it's not because we have Wi-Fi that's a decent Wi-Fi. Even if 54 meg of Wi-Fi may be behind to go to the internet, it's only 10 meg. So it's better to go over 3G, for instance, and so on. Very interesting as well, you can put stuff like no internet, true. Why would you do it? For, Capti for a wall garden. Okay. If your TV set is received over an ISP using ULA or whatever to receive your streaming, you do not want to use this specific IP address and routers and internet connectivity because there's no internet. You only go access to the wall garden. We can say as well whether there is a captive portal. Because maybe, I mean, everyone hates captive portal, right? Um, my name here, by the way, sorry for BT, my name is Fubar, right? I'm john at fubar.com. I don't want to give out my, my address. I guess a lot of Fubar people here, right? <laughs> I see so. Anyway, a big company. So, but we have an issue with captive portal, for instance. Most of us open on Google or on Facebook. The Google and the Facebook are using SSL. And they're even using HSTS. So pinpointing the certificate. So if you rely on redirect, like a couple of captive portal, you will receive warning. Because what pretends to be the Facebook or um, Google is actually a captive portal. Of course, with a self-signed certificate that they don't recognize. And even if it was not self-signed, it will be broken. Because it's not the certificate that Facebook or Google told you with HSTS. So we need to find something else, and this is this captive portal uh, URL there. So, and we are, the more we talk about it, the more information we talk. So where are we there? Lot of implementation. Okay, so 
we have funded some people to work on Linux implementation. Um, we modified as well Array DVD, which is the open source route advertisement daemon. So basically, if you have a Linux router, you can send PVDs in the array. Or DHCP, it's for basically OpenWRT. Uh, Wireshark can decode, and Linux can receive it, and we have some application there. Everything is in public domain, so go there. And if you know for who I'm working for, we have already experimental code, basically, uh, to send array uh, from a normal router. So it's there, it's coming, um, it's very easy to implement. And the hackathon at the IETF in Prague last summer, uh, which was basically a couple of engineers and geeks coming all together over Saturday and Sunday. There are beers on Saturday afternoon, right? So it explains why we are there on Saturday, um, at least. And we wrote code implementing this. And there were the author from Apple there basically built this in his iOS. Okay, so there were two iOS implementations uh, on the table, which was quite fun. There is also a project I'm working on uh, called NEAT. So <laughs> kind of interesting to talk there in this country, uh, if you don't mind. It's a EU-funded project, right, called H2020 where a couple of universities, including Aberdeen in, in Scotland, and we work about rewriting basically the transport layer. So for the application, it will request something like a connection-oriented, no packet lost, and then it's up to this firmware in the middle to negotiate with the other side on which IP address, something like IP eyeball, but you can have multiple IPv6 and IPv4 addresses, so you need to select which one, and which transport layer? We use TCP, UDP, SCTP, something like that, right? They negotiate this, and our input there was basically how we can use PVDs to tag or to associate one source IP address with some specific services or price. And we make up in our project there a couple of pop-up. If you see multiple networks, right now we see SSID protected, yes or no, but think about it, right? We can get multiple services, even on the same interface, right? Don't forget in IPv6, you can have multiple addresses per interface, so even on one interface, and you can get basically whether it's secure, protected by a VPN, how long it will take, for instance, to download the file, uh, and the cost maybe. So we were thinking about this, and we will get a demonstration um, very soon on this. Okay, PVDs is to provision a host to say, hey, if you use this source address, you will get this price, this performance, or you will go there. Now, we still need to ensure that, remember, the blue packet needs to go to the upside and the red packet needs to go to the bottom side based on the source, which is kind of interesting. And all we do it, basically, each and every FIB entry for the information base or route uh, to oversimplify, is associated with a source prefix. And that's a couple of drafts there. Uh, this one is David Lampaner and Smirnov, Anton. So all the FIB entries are associated with a source prefix. If you want to fall back to the case where we do destination-only routing, you associate it with the any, right? Colon, colon, slash, zero. Then we get all those entries associating a source prefix. Most of them will be colon, colon, zero, and a couple of them making for exception, okay? Like the Microsoft inside going to Azure. There will be one specific entry. And now it's a little bit more complex. So the easiest way to explain it is this one, but it's not the way it's done and implemented because it's the worst one regarding the performance. Okay, so you still do a destination match, longest match. So you will get there multiple entries. And then you do the longest match on the source now. If it's a match, like a colon colon slash zero, that will be, of course, a match, done. But if you don't find a match, because it was a very specific route only for this prefix to this prefix, you go back to step one and you search for the longest prefix, but one bit less. 
So you can get a match at slash 128, for instance, but not the, the, the source. Then a match on 127, but no match on the source, and you fall back. So clearly, it's not the way it's implemented, right? But it's the way it's explained. So we still do on destination, the match. We get a set of potential entries, and we try to find one which is the longest match over the source. If not, we go back to the square one. Obviously, it's not how it's implemented. For instance, look about this SEDER. Oh, yeah, SEDER means source address dependent routing. It's, it's, we pronounce it SEDER. So, first line is basically colon colon zero to colon colon zero. So, any source to any destination use this router tree. The green light say, hey, for this slash 32 going to anywhere, use router tree. The kind of uh, red one, for this specific slash 64 going anywhere, use another router. OK? First example here. And I put, of course, the colors right. If the source is DB8 1.1 to destination whatever, so destination, the three entries will match. Okay? The three entries are the longest match on the destination. So which is the longest match I can find on the source? There's a green one. So we'll go to the router tree. Second example with the red address. Longest match on destination, I mean, it's easy, right? It's default. So all the three, longest match on the source, it's only the red entries. So I will go to router four. And that's basically how we do it. Now, Seder, I mean, most of the routers right now do not have Seder. Linux routing has it, okay? Uh, if you know about an open domain called FDIO, Vector Packet Processing, VPP, is also it. And we are working on an implementation in, in our own routers. But not every router got it. And you cannot really expect any router being deployed like this uh, within next year, right? So in this case, how can I ensure that if this laptop is using an IP address from ISP2, because I want to do multi-homing without BGP, is really exiting that way. The only place where you need to do it, if you think about it, there's router three and router four on the top, the edge one. All the rest, look, packets will go, will follow the left hand part, arrive at router three. On this one, I put a CD route forwarding to router four. And of course, on router four, you do the reverse. Okay, and you make it dynamic. It's not the optimum routing, right? It would be way better to go directly from R1, R6, R4, for instance. But at least it works. Okay, and even the traffic with the blue or the red will exit with the red or the blue edge router, which is exactly what you want. Now, to make things a bit more complex, if R3 and R4 are not adjacent next to each other, you will need a tunnel, of course, which is ugly, or source um, segment routing, which is trendy, but it's still kind of um, ugly. So, SEDER for multi-homing. That's the second piece, right? You need to bundle and ensure that when we do DNS request, we use an IPv6 address linked to the DNS server, linked to the next op. There's the PVD. An application can even select it. Once you have selected the source address, you need to be sure that SEDER will route the packets through the right egress point, specifically in the multi-homing case. SEDER uh, is not a black or white thing. Uh, the real interest is to deploy it at the edge. The deeper on your network it's deployed, the better, of course, for latency, right? But we are also modifying the ITF, OSPF, and ISIS, and the other like to, to support SEDER. I mean, there are some risk if you deploy SEDER without knowing what you do. So it should be done correctly. So conclusion, and, and it's time allows, so I will go uh, for a short demonstration on SEDER, because that's interesting. So can we go on the video? So it is basically the same setup, and we are currently on the client here. I am using a trace route from one specific source address and you see, if you can read, the trace route is going and exiting by the ISP1. 
client one has got two addresses. So I'm trying from the another source to the two. And you see it's going to the default for the same space. But at the end, it was exclamation A, 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 failing. Because the service provider is doing some um, anti-spoofing. So we are now on the router three, just below ISP1, so the exit router. And we see that for any address, we have only one entries. Okay, and we have the seder table, which is empty. So we'll try to configure seder. So let's go. Forget about those debugging. I, I should have waited a little bit more uh, before booting. So I enter one prefix. I say here, I will be specific a source address on 2001 colon one, another one at 2001 colon two. So I enter the two prefixes where I will enter specific route. And if I show the table, I see those two prefixes plus the implicit zero, which is the, uh, the any, right? Colon, colon, slash zero. OK. Time to enter now the source address specific route, actually Fibon trees. So to go to this server from this source prefix, like 2001, I need to use this specific next stop, Ethernet zero and the next stop there. Some of the beginning entries. There's an engineering image. So IPv6 route for the same destination now, right? But for different prefix 2001.2, use the other interface, Ethernet 0 slash 2. Some more debugging being displayed. And now we will see that the information on the exit router, on the egress router, has changed. So we still have, by using the, the route entries, is the same because we receive it from OSPF. Now, but if we look, and the safe entries, which is basically the, the, the fib, is vastly different. I, I have no time to explain all the entries here. That's how we optimize it, right? Basically, we do not know this going back and back and back and back. We pre-compute the table. That's what you see here. Now we we'll go back to the client. And I redo the trace route, that, the one which was working, yeah. Working fine, router one, two, three, ISP one, internet. Now I redo it, the one we was failing. So it's going as well, one, two, three, four now. Based on the source, we forward it, the packets not to ISP one, directly in the top, but to R four, right? And then of course, we went to ISP two. Very, very simple way to fix the multi-homing here. So can you get back the slides? Thank you. So multi-homing in V6 for SMB, so without BGP, is vastly different, right? We do not want to use NPT, for sure. Uh, we want to get active and active. So one way of doing it is this with Seder. We need as well to have, to understand that OS nowadays has got multiple address interface, and each interface can have multiple prefix and multiple routers there. So we need to teach and and tell the routers how to select which IPv6 address and which interface. At least use it as a bundle, and we can provide more detail about the connectivity in the application layer through PVDs and the extended information over in the JSON file. That's better. And we were thinking and rewriting something like, like the Mozilla or the Firefox or the OpenWLC, for instance, to help them selecting based on the um, PVD name. Having done this, whether you are using the application layer stuff or not, or simply routing, we need to teach the network at least the egress that based on the source, go that way and that way. Then the problem will be solved. Uh, I am working at the ITF for more than 15 years now. Uh, I must admit I never seen such a momentum and basically no obstruction to those two drafts because there is a real interest there. With this, any questions? <laughs> you want to do some exercise for the... <laughs> I'm going there, I'm going there, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> I wasn't sure what was the shortest route. I mean, the show is in the room, actually, right? So. We need a routing protocol for the room. Yeah, we need yeah, to, yeah. for the mics. <laughs> but it's a layer two, right? So it's meaning spanning three or something. <laughs> I, I, <no. laughs>
Uh, Tim Vaux from Foview. Uh, I'm glad you're working on this problem because it's a problem that uh, we had. I worked for a small company with around 20 people and we ended up getting PI space and BGP because the world was going nuts without this. I want to know how you're thinking about detecting ISP failure. You have two ISPs and one of them decides to, to go crazy. Yeah. How do you, what's so, your thoughts on that? So on, on this, so typically in this case, ISP1 and ISP2, one can fail. So it's basically another draft from, from Google in this case and other people that detect that when we do not have the connectivity via one specific, we stop at the bottom. Right, can I go back? Uh, anyway, you remember the bottom? The, the, the router that's sending the, the prefixes via router advertisement stop advertising the prefix from the failed ISP link. That's how it's done at the car. We don't really reroute inside because we don't care too much. We could do it, obviously. And that's why OSPF, we've said that we'll do. I, th uh, I, think, uh, I think the fact you just mentioned OSPF, that means it's quite a large network. Okay. You know, but, uh, but you're saying just drop the, drop the route yeah. announcement so, as soon as it goes. Correct. So now, if you have, it's, you can even do it right now with um, tickle scripting on routers, I mean, from, from, from my side and others. You send an array with a lifetime of zero. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work in theory, yeah, but that's... That, that's it does work. Yeah. We try in apps, though. Now, it depends on which router, but yeah. typically, and you can confirm, every time we are receiving a PIO with a lifetime of zero, is deprecated immediately and not use anymore. So we only use the other one. Okay, you should test that in, uh, in real world examples because even with Linux clients, uh, I've seen situations where you send the lifetime of zero and IPv6 never works going on the host until it reboots. So that's a, that's a problem we, we, we've come across. Okay. And, hey. and I, I, I worked on this for several months before just deciding to just get some PI space because, you know, yeah. it's, it's very, um, it's multiple problems. Like, yeah. There's a lot yeah, more things to solve the, the problem yeah. for sure. So, okay. So, um, uh, Liquid Telecom, Andrew from Liquid Telecom had the same issues with routers not uh, not withdrawing those prefixes when the prefix when the default route went away, and that was one of his main reasons for advocating for static IPv6 prefix delegations instead of dynamic. So it could be kind of those same issues what you're seeing in that in your example. Okay. I really do my test. <laughs> Yeah. I, oh, <clears throat> I have a question. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but sorry if the question um, doesn't make sense. Is fair to say that this is some kind of policy-based routing? That's fair to say that it replaced policy-based routing. <laughs> so now, my second question is, how does this scale with full routing tables? It, so, two points there. First, policy-based routing is quite static, and in the of implementation, uh, it's poor performance. This one, we can tune in the implementation because it's only changing, it's doing policy-based routing only based on the source, not on TCP ports or whatever. So it can be more optimized. Right? Sure, but for That's example, if you have like, if your network is very fragmented and you are not able to aggregate in one block. So now, regarding the scalability, uh, we, the way, we see the use case, it's typically very small exception. So for instance, to tell you, um, the way it's optimized in Cisco routers is we have 16 maximum uh, route with a source prefix out of 1,000. So we made some tests because it's available on, in engineering image on some hardware. And we make some tests with 16 source prefix and 10,000 normal fib entries, right? We don't do one internet, right? It's for enterprise stuff here. Performance, it was mainly 1% in the worst case. Okay, so it's not target for full internet right? And absolutely not, that's an enterprise solution. No, 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 of course not. And does this will work in... It's not even for the Facebook of the world, right? So yeah. Will this work in generic uh, Tomahawk or Trident 2 Jericho hardware or only proprietary hardware? So it will, for instance, we have one implementation in software and one implementation in one hardware, but we spend, I mean, not me, but the engineer in, in, in Shanghai spend mostly one month of tuning everything from the code which works fine on software to using this specific hardware with this specific network processor, right? And using parallelism and this kind of stuff. So, yeah. It, it's not easy. You can design hardware for doing it from scratch. That's easy. But retrofitting on existing hardware. This is where I see the biggest challenge to adopt this. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and again, it will not be used tomorrow, right? Uh, but it could be used from small SMB with one or two routes, basically, yeah. And, I mean, my wife is working in SMB, she is multi-home, and I want her to have VSIC without NAT. It will solve my problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And bigger as well, right? But. So really quickly, um, in regards to, uh, obviously this is a stitch on a little bit for uh, 8106, right? Because you can use the same prefix listing order for domain namespace, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But I'm curious about what about when folks want to start hammering on a particular interface, like your wireless provider decides you want to tether all your traffic to get the bill up, they're going to put a higher prefix component set in the PVD, and then list all the domains for the popular sites. And then, oh. right, there, there can be a little bit of abuse going on there in terms of what could potentially get published. And then also, what happens when you have conflicts within the two JSON files that have the same namespaces but don't have a declarative uh, uh, tiebreaker? Yeah, so if you have, we can I simplify a bit the explanation. So you can receive by, from two array, from two interface, or from two routers on the same interface, the same PVD ID. The intent is to say, yeah, this is BT, for instance, or Sky, or whatever, from multiple interface, and they deliver the same services. So in this case, they were, and we write in the draft, the JSON file content should be the same. Else, most of it will be the last one, we get it. But normally the JSON, again, um, it must be the same, except if you are very dirty in your setting, because as soon as you get the same PVD ID of a wireless, uh, well, let's say cellular and wide, you go to the same URL, right, to fetch it. HTTPS, blah, blah. So now, if you have a CDN, we just don't deliver the same content based on where you are coming from, this is maybe the case, but then it's a very, very common case. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. sort of the same. It's a reverse way. Yeah, I was just in interest of time. Thank you very much, Eric. Keep the questions. Uh, when are no, you, you, I you need are to leave going in 15 minutes, sorry. But anyway, we, we have a discussion at the end, right? We still got a bit of a buffer at the end of the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you.